All right, hello and welcome back. Um, if you are watching this, then I'm going to assume that you watched the how to prep for a base panel video. If you have not, I highly suggest you go back and watch that before you watch this so you have a better understanding of what I'm going to be talking about. So we are going to be talking about fiberglass today. I am going to actually fiberglass over the part that we uh, protected to do the base panel layout. So before we get started, I just want to talk about the fiberglass that I have in front of me and the fiberglass resin that we'll be using. So first up, what we're going to typically see right now in the industry is you're going to see a variation of this. This is your fiberglass cloth. This is stuff that, you know, you can pick this up at like AutoZone, you know, Home Depot, Lowe's. Um, this is literally cloth. I do not use this stuff. Um, to be perfectly honest with you, I hate it. The reason being, uh, I find it to be a little bit more difficult to work with personally. Uh, and the other reason that I do not like to use this is because cloth like this is great for strength in one direction. And when we're talking about making, you know, a part from scratch or a moldless composite, we want strength in every direction. So, you know, typically you see a lot of this in layups with molds and that will have a gel coat. If you don't know what a gel coat is, that is basically, for lack of better words, a very thick primer that is sprayed into a mold that the fiberglass then gets uh, resined into. I really do not like gel coats. Uh, there's a lot of companies that use gel coats. You know, they, they pr try and promote their parts as paint ready. Uh, in my experience, companies that use gel coats, and I'm not bashing, please don't take this as bashing, just my experience. When people use gel coats, it leads me to believe that there is maybe some shoddy work, uh, that their mold is not the greatest. Um, and there's going to be people that argue that tooth and nail. I have used, you know, gel coats in the past myself. I have gone away from them. Uh, it's just not something that I really like to use. But again, every manufacturer, every builder, every person has their own unique style of doing things. I am not talking trash. I am just speaking personally. So we're going to take this cloth and basically chuck it because I just wanted to show it to you. You're not going to be using it in this process. What you're going to be using in this process is what is referred to as chop strand mat. This is my bread and butter in fiberglass. And I have two pieces in front of you. This is what I use to start off with. This is ounce and a half chop strand mat. They call it chop strand mat because literally these strands are chopped up. I'm trying to pull some off here so you can see them. These strands are, you know, chopped up and they use a binder and basically lay it out in a sheet and bind it all together. The resin penetrates this, breaks down the binder and actually solidifies the fiberglass. So when we're talking about, you know, ounce and a half, or in this case, this is a two ounce, we're talking about the thickness and they use that, you know, how many ounces basically to build up, you know, the weight, etc. You can look all the technical stuff up, um, but really all you need to remember is ounce and a half and two ounces. These are probably the two that you would use the most in making a part like what I'm doing on Project Rising Sun. I like to use my ounce and a half as a base. And the reason I like it is because it absorbs quickly and it breaks down quickly. So when you're going to do multiple layups or like multiple layers, if you can put a base down like this, that will break down quickly, hold your resin. You can then go to your thicker two ounce right on top and it will make, you know, wetting this stuff out a lot easier. It also will build up material thickness, strength, etc. So that's pretty much what we're going to be using is these two pieces here or, you know, these two weights. Um, but let's talk about our resin because this is really a big one for a lot of people. They do not know they haven't done fiberglass before, and there's so many different, you know, resins out there, epoxies, it can kind of get overwhelming if you don't know terminology. So I buy my products from a company here locally in Phoenix called sticky stuff. I've been using them for years. I love them. They, you know, provide me with consistent product. And I'm a creature of habit. When I find a product that works well for me, I do not stray because if it can produce the same thing time and time again and I'm comfortable with it, 
why change? So this is labeled as their GP resin, which is, you know, for lack of better words, their general purpose. But what you need to know it is a polyester or called poly resin. And this is one of the most popular resins used in making composites. There's another one that you could potentially use and I have used in the past, which is called a vinyl ester. And that is typically seen more in applications where you're talking about something that's going to see a lot of moisture, uh, boats, for example, um, something that, you know, needs UV protection. It's a bit of a different, you know, chemical composition. I'm not going to go into all the details. If you want to figure it out and look it up yourself, go for it. Um, but really all you need is a good quality polyester resin. Now, what we have here is MEKP. This is our catalyst or hardener. Uh, when people refer to hardener, this is what they're talking about. The real terminology is catalyst. So if you're going to go to a fiberglass store and you're asking for something and you want to sound like you actually know what you're talking about, ask them for catalyst. Don't say hardener. They'll just laugh at you. I've had it happen. Trust me. Um, so this is basically the stuff that we're going to be using to produce our base panels. I'm going to go over, I'm going to actually show you how I lay up, you know, fiberglass over the part that we put the tape on previously. I'm going to have to do a little bit of a voiceover because I have to wear a respirator. So I apologize in advance if the audio is not the same. You might have to adjust, you know, your audio levels, but I'm going to do my best, you know, when I do my editing to try and make sure I get it so it's close. So yeah, this is pretty much what we're going to be using. And so let's get into some fiberglass. This is my mixing table. I suggest you do this on a surface, you know, that you do not care about because resin is messy and it is kind of hard to clean up. So yeah, I would suggest doing it in a, a spot that you don't care about. The first thing that we're going to do is open our can and we're going to mix our resin. If your resin has been sitting for any period of time, I highly suggest mixing it before you actually pour. We just want to make sure that it is thoroughly mixed. The one thing I want to say about mixing is you do not want to add unnecessary air bubbles, so stir gently. You do not want to make the resin slosh around in the can. You simply just want to stir it up. I like to have a spare rag or, you know, paper towel around just to wipe any kind of excess resin off. Helps control the mess. And the next step is going to be pour our resin. Now, I know that I'm going to be pouring approximately four ounces. That's based on the amount of fiberglass that I'm going to be using. That's kind of a trial and error thing for you. You'll get used to it as you get more familiar with using fiberglass and fiberglass resin. I put little holes in the ridge of the can. It helps the fiberglass resin uh, drain back into the can. It's a little trick you can use. It helps keep things clean. I won't be using this resin anymore, so I'm just going to put the, can the lid back on the can. Make sure it's tight. You don't want to let the air get to it any uh, longer than necessary. I have a little mixing chart. This is supplied by the manufacturer. I'll show it to you here. This gives you your temperature and mix ratios. So you want to see what temperature you are currently working in and that'll tell you how much of your catalyst you will need per ounce of resin. It's currently 96 in the garage here and so we are going to mix accordingly. When you want to mix your catalyst, you do not want to shake the bottle. Again, you want to keep air bubbles to a minimum, so you just kind of want to stir it around like this. This is the best way I've found to do it. I'm also using catalyst that has a red dye. That makes mixing into the fiberglass a lot easier because you can visually see when it's thoroughly mixed.
I'm going to use a syringe. I get these from the fiberglass supply store. I'm going to measure out my catalyst. This goes by cc's. In this case, it was a little over 1.3 cc's. I recommend putting the cap on your catalyst because I've seen a lot of people spill it. Make sure you don't spill it. Now I'm just going to dump my resin into my mixing cup. You want to use a wax lined paper cup like this, otherwise you run the chance of your fiberglass resin actually melting through the cup, which absolutely sucks. I've had it happen. Now we're just going to put the catalyst into the resin. Make sure you get all the catalyst that you can into there. Little tip, pull the plunger out of your syringe, wipe it off. You can use it again, otherwise the catalyst will eat away at the rubber plunger and it'll be done after one use. When mixing your resin, you really want to pay attention and make sure that it is thoroughly mixed. Now when I squirted the catalyst into the cup, a little bit landed on the side, so I just Tilt my cup and stir into it to make sure that I'm getting all that catalyst mixed into the resin really good. You have to remember that you're working in a time window here. You have about 15 minutes to get this resin onto the fiberglass. But, you know, you want to take your time here and make sure that you get this stuff thoroughly mixed. I was just checking to make sure it was thoroughly mixed and I'm happy with it. So I'm gonna grab my two inch chip brush, wipe off the excess from my stick, my uh, paint stick here, set it aside, let it dry. You can reuse it again. Don't wipe your head with a rag like I did because I put resin on my forehead, which was awesome. This would be the point that you would want to add your mold release. Um, in this case, we're not gonna use one. This is just for demonstrations. I'll explain that later. So what we're going to do is actually just spread our resin on our tape here. You can see how I'm just trying to spread it all around, make a nice even coat. This will help to break down the fiberglass from the back side. This also helps keep your fiberglass mat in place once you put it down. Now this is my ounce and a half mat. This is what I'm going to start with first. So what I'm gonna do is just simply put it in place and I'm going to start by adding resin to the center of the mat. I like to work from the center to the edges. This helps just keep everything in place as I go. You want to make sure that, you know, when you start, you, you really want to get this stuff down heavy. You can't really overdo it here. Um, it's going to take a little bit of time to break down. So do not concentrate all your resin in one spot. You know, you have a limited time window. So the idea here, get the resin down as fast as you can. Get the fiberglass to break down. Get it to conform to the part. You can see in the center, it's already starting to kind of you know, stick to the tape. You can kind of see the shiny tape come through. That's what we want. And again, I'm just working out to the edge. A little trick with this is add a little extra of your glass mat beyond your edge. It'll help add a little additional weight and keep the part in place. I'm not going to add resin all the way out to the edge of the fiberglass. I'm just going to add or resin out to the edge of my part. Now you can see there's kind of spots that have, it looks like it might have a little bit of an air pocket in there. That's okay. The fiberglass is going to continue to lift until it fully breaks down. Do not spend a lot of time, you know, going over those air pockets. Just let it do its job. It will break down and it will lay down. Just give it time. Here I am basically just finishing out the edge here. And you can see I'm really trying to put a lot of that resin on that edge. This will help keep your part in place.
I'm actually pulling, and that is kind of almost like stretching the fiberglass mat. This will help kind of, you know, anything that's uneven, it'll help kind of pull it around and create a really nice surface. You can see how the mat is really conformed to the headlight now. This is exactly what I was looking for. Now I'm going to go back into the very center because originally all that resin that was breaking down, you know, we, we were trying to get as much as we could in there, but we're going to start seeing little air holes, little bubbles, whatever. So we want to start getting all those out. The number one thing with fiberglass here is trying to get as little to no air bubbles in it as possible. I'm just visually looking at the piece as I work around it, looking for spots that I'm unhappy with, things that I may want to fix. One of the nice things about glass mat is that as it breaks down, you can kind of use your paintbrush to move the individual strands around. So if you have a spot that looks a little bit high, you can kind of move it around, level it out, add more resin, just do it as you need it. This is kind of a trial and error thing. This is why I recommend, you know, when you get products like this, you do test pieces first, become familiar with the product, learn how to use it before you go on to your full project. What I'm doing by putting the paintbrush up and down like that, I'm actually using the bristles to kind of pop air bubbles. And if I feel like it needs more resin, I just use more resin, add it to that spot. Good to go. Now I'm going to put my next piece of mat down. This is the two ounce. You can see as soon as I put it down how it automatically starts to soak up the resin. This is why I like to use two layers like this. Again, I'm just starting from the center. I'm going to work my way out. This two ounce takes a lot more time to break down. It takes more resin. So you have to be kind of patient with it. Again, the idea here is to get the resin down as quick as possible. You do not want to spend a lot of time staring at one spot. You want to get this resin down. You'll run into a situation where the resin will actually start to solidify in the cup and you won't be done and you'll kind of be screwed, but don't worry, you can just mix more resin, keep going. Again, you can see how I'm just working the edges. I want to try and lock down this mat. Again, if it lifts, do not worry. One tip I will give you is that when you are putting your second layer on, you can add pressure, but be very careful that you're not making the first layer move around. As I'm adding my second layer and I can start to see through, again, I'm looking for any kind of air bubbles that might be in the first layer that I may have missed. If I see something, I'll just add more resin, keep pushing, get those air bubbles out. You can actually see how much stiffer this two ounce mat is in the way that it's laying. Again, I'm kind of using that pulling method. This just kind of helps even it out. When I mix my resin, I usually account for, you know, 
having to add a little extra. So when I'm done, I usually end up with about an ounce of leftover. That's really not a big deal. I mean, you can always just throw it away. It's not going to hurt anything, you know. But the worst part is when you run out and you have to go mix more. What I'm basically going to do now is start chasing air bubbles. Now, this is a demonstration piece, so I'm not going to go super crazy. I know that there's going to be tiny little, you know, air holes, little, no, well, not really holes, but little air bubbles in between the two layers. Normally, I would use a roller at this point to start chasing out those little air bubbles. You want to just kind of push them out to the edge. It's the easiest way to get them out. But just for this demonstration, I'm just going to kind of show you how to do it with, the, with this chip brush. Again, pushing down with bristles is a nice way to pop any air bubbles underneath it. You only have about 15 minutes, as I said, but you really want to take your time and be thorough. The number one reason that I uh, talk to people that have issues with delaminating between their layers is they're not really worried about these air bubbles. You want to make sure that this is solid resin in between the two layers. You will know when you're getting close to your resin uh, starting to solidify it's going to get thicker. It's going to get easier to fill air bubbles, but it's also, you know, you're at that point where you're kind of on borrowed time where it's gonna to start to solidify and it's not going to be usable anymore. This is probably the number one reason why I wanna stress that you wanna get your resin down on your mat, get everything down that you can so that you have adequate time to kind of chase air bubbles at the end. If you were to spend a lot of time worrying about fiberglass not actually, you know, laying down you wanted to right away, you'll end up wasting time and you'll be kind of screwed with your part. Getting really close to the end here. It's getting harder and harder to get the resin out of the cup. So, you know, you really want to hustle at this point. You can see again, I'm using that paintbrush to pop air, air bubbles in there. I can also, you know, use my paintbrush to, like I said, move pieces of the uh, chopped strand around to really try and level out the surface. For me personally, I find where I start with my mat meaning like in the center, is usually where I am the lightest, only because I'm more concerned about getting the resin down over everything. So I try to concentrate on where I start first, you know, to make sure that when I'm close to being done with my project that I have those areas really wet out. You can see I'm kind of just folding down those edges, just adding a little extra weight. This will help keep your fiberglass, you know, where you want it.
And at that point, you can see how it's already starting to solidify. So this is pretty much the end of this cup. Here I am, you can see me actually moving some of the, the mat around. There's a spot that lay a little uneven, so I'm just kind of, you know, moving those strands around. Get them where I like them. Last thing I do is actually do that stretch again. And at this point, this is pretty much done. So now I've let this part cure and it's time to remove it. Um, now in the video, you'll see I did not use a mold release agent. That's one of those things where it's kind of, you know, up to you how you want to do it. With this aluminum tape, you don't necessarily need it, but and this is a big but. If you use a mold release agent, it will make pulling this fiberglass off so much easier. I've used um, sprayable PVA, which you can get from a fiberglass uh, supply store. Great product. I've used pure carnauba wax, like straight up car wax. It works great. I've tried using PAM cooking spray. I mean, you name it, I probably tried it to see if I could get a release agent to make the fiberglass, you know, so much easier to remove from our part. Having said all that, there is a benefit for me personally, and this is again, I'm only speaking in the context of how I do things and however, you know, someone else wants to do it, that is totally up to them. For me, when I lay things up without a mold release agent, I have found that I get a better part in the way of fitment. And really because when the original layer of fiberglass resin that I put down on the aluminum tape before I put the fiberglass down, when that kind of cures, it really does kind of, you know, build a nice little, I don't know, it's not really an adhesion, um, but it allows the fiberglass to stay in place. I have used, like I said, a lot of different mold release agents and some of them allow the fiberglass to actually kind of move on the part until it really starts to kick or solidify. So again, that's just one of the things that I've found. Um, you may find things to be different and by all means, experiment. I highly suggest if you're going to try do this stuff, take the time to get supplies, you know, do a bunch of tests. I mean, try and do things, you know, a bunch of different parts and see what works for you before you actually start your project. And once you start doing your, you know, the project that you want to produce as a, as a final product, if you get stuck along the way, and I've had it happen to me, it sucks because you, know, you put all that time and energy into something only to be like, oh, shit, what do I do now? So I am trying to do things the hardest way that I know how to show all of you the pitfalls and the advantages. Um, we're gonna pop this off. And again, I'm, I'm gonna try and do overhead camera so you can see. And um, so before we get into that, I wanna talk about the tools that I used. So the first thing that you have to do when you're trying to pop this off is you have to break the surface tension. And if you get a lot of resin that kind of runs over an edge, it's hard to pop these things off without a release agent. I have, you know, a little, it's just a, basically, shows material thickness for steel, but the nice thing about them is they come in a lot of different thicknesses. So, you know, I can take this and because it's flexible, I can run this, you know, underneath my fiberglass and kind of break that surface tension. I can kind of start walking around an edge, you know, the whole way around and try and get that resin that's stuck to the, the aluminum tape to break loose. From there, I like to use a little panel removal tool. Um, I've had this one for a while and you can see it's pretty beat up. And I use this to pop off my resin when, or my fiberglass after it's cured. Now, 
when I'm building things, there are very few times that I actually use a release agent only because I'm used to popping these parts off. And I'm be honest with you, it, it sucks. But like I said, there's a reason why I do it. If it's a really complex shape, I mean, a lot of like compound curves or something that you're like, wow, this is really going to be a nightmare to try and pull it off. I highly suggest, like I said, get a, a mold release agent, put it down, lay out your, your fiberglass. It'll make your life so much easier. So that's pretty much all of that. So let's just pop this thing off now. So here this goes. So normally I would have a part, you know, in between my hands or in a way that I could actually, you know, physically manipulate it much easier. But, you know, again, for demonstration purposes, I'm going to do it this way. Uh, this is probably going to really suck for me, but let's see how we can do this. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take, like I said, my little metal gauge here. And I'm going to find a spot underneath here that I can work this into. Now, luckily for me, I looked at this part, you know, to try and find a good spot and I actually found one. And what I want to show you is there you can see right here, I've got that in there. Now, once I can work this around, I'm going to start breaking surface tension. And you really need to get a spot started like this to get this guy in there. Now, since I've got this spot started, I'm going to slide this in, which is always so much fun. And I'm going to start working this around my edge. Now, you can hear me. I am pushing pretty damn hard. Like I said, normally I'd be doing this much easier for me. But, you know, for all of you, I'm going to do it the hardest way so that you hopefully do not have to do it the hardest way. And you can see right in here, I'm breaking that surface tension and it's already starting to lift. So when I get a spot like this, I like to work it, and get that thing in there. Now you want to be careful. You, you can overdo it. I mean, this is pretty strong, but if you were to continue to just try and force this in here, you're going to crack your fiberglass. So, I'm going to try and work towards me because pushing against it kind of sucked. And again, this is not normally this hard if you use a release agent, but I'm kind of an idiot and decided it would be great to show everybody the hardest freaking way to do everything. So here we go. So what's actually happening here is my squeegee or my tool here is getting underneath the aluminum tape. It happens, you know, without that release agent, this tape is going to want to really stick. Like I said, for me, when I'm trying to get a part to really, really, really have a, a, a really true fit, this is the best method. Um, not having the fiberglass wander when I'm laying it up, it's a big deal for me. But, like I said, trial and error, do what works for you. Once you get a nice section kind of, you know, pulling away, it does get easier. And I don't know if you can see this or not. Hopefully you can. Through the fiberglass, if you look through the fiberglass in here, as I walk this tool around, you will see 
kind of an air pocket start to form. And that's what we're looking for because that's, you know, releasing our fiberglass. I'm wearing gloves, my welding gloves, because if you've never handled dry fiberglass, it's like handling a box of, you know, nails or handful of needles. It will jab you, stab you, you will bleed. It sucks. And not only that, it seems to burn forever. So protect your hands. And you can hear it kind of crackling. That's not the fiberglass. That's actually the tape starting to release. That's a good thing. You will know the difference between that sound and your fiberglass cracking. And that's usually followed with a bunch of curse words and the occasional throwing something across the room. So now I've got this thing I've walked around my whole edge. So now we can simply push and I think it's about to go. There we go. And there's the inside of our part. And you can see here, my aluminum tape did not stick. The, the uh, painter's tape here, still intact. I've done absolutely no damage to the surface underneath. Um, and that's a big thing, you know, because when we're talking about, you know, doing this straight off of a vehicle, you know, you do not want to damage everything underneath. So that's pretty much it here. The one thing I do want to say is, if you look on the inside here, and I'm hoping that the camera gets this, you can actually see my tape lines in here. There's this crisscross pattern. You can see it, but you can also see here how smooth this surface is. I mean, that's really good. This only really needs a light scuff and I can bomb this, you know, or I can go to paint or whatever I want to do with it. The other thing is that you have to know is that when you're doing this stuff, like working from the inside out, this would be what you would see the reverse on a mold. So if I were to lay this up in a mold, the shiny side or the really smooth side would be what you would get when you pull this out of the mold. For us, we get the gnarly side. You know, this is all the fiberglass mat that has not had like a really nice straight surface to give us this really straight, you know, shiny surface. It's really smooth. So from here, we have to understand that when we're building these composite parts like this, this is the part that we're going to have to body work. That is probably the number one issue with doing this method is that you're going to have to sand this stuff down to level it all, level it all out, get little, you know, all the little bumps and stuff out of it. But yeah, so that's pretty much what you're shooting for. Uh, to lay up a base panel. And once you have your base panel like this laid up, you can actually see the outer perimeter here. It shows you really nicely, if I wanted to trim this, let's say to, to you know mimic the actual lens, you can see my line here. That's a very, very, very accurate line to trim off of. And if you were to use a fine point or a fine tip marker, you know, which is basically about a little over a 32nd of an inch. That's very accurate in the world of fab fiberglass to me. Um, again, this is just how I do things. And hopefully this is going to show you the right, you know, the right way to do what it is that you want to do. And again, if you guys have questions, um, please let me know.